Welcome to the Deep Dive. Our mission here, well, it's pretty simple. We dig through a whole stack of sources to pull out the most important bits of knowledge, the key insights. Think of us as your shortcut to uh, really being well-informed. Helping cut through the noise. Exactly. So here's something to think about. Is your idea of money kind of stuck in the past? Or are you ready to, you know, get a handle on how these decentralized digital ledgers are already securing things? Everything from supply chains to maybe even your next paycheck. It's a really pivotal moment, isn't it? The signs are, well, they're everywhere if you look closely. Absolutely. So today we're doing a deep dive into blockchain and cryptocurrencies beyond the buzz. We're not just going to define terms. No, we're aiming to unpack how these technologies are like fundamentally reshaping how we think about trust, about value, even governance in this digital age. And the market's definitely paying attention. Oh, for sure. Bitcoin recently smashed past $120,000. New record highs. And part of that seems fueled by some uh, pretty significant moves in Congress. Mm -hmm. Bills like the Genius Act, the Clarity Act, they're pushing crypto more into the mainstream. Yeah, and it's not just the price that's interesting. It's the big players getting involved. Like Bank of America isn't just kicking the tires. They're out there saying stable coins are uh, fundamental to the future of finance, payments, e-commerce, you name it. Mm. And look at Wall Street. There's a noticeable shift happening less focus maybe on Bitcoin mining, which takes a lot of energy, and more towards uh, Ethereum staking. That points directly towards this idea of programmable money becoming more central. That is a big signal. Okay, so for this deep dive, here's how we'll tackle it. Three main parts. First, we'll really peel back the layers on blockchain. What is it? Sure, but more importantly, why is its structure so, well, disruptive? Got it. The foundation. Right. Second, we'll look at cryptocurrencies. Moving past just the price charts to grasp you know, their actual design, their role in maybe a new kind of financial system. Beyond just Bitcoin. Exactly. And third, we'll explore the real world impact. What's happening right now in 2025, the applications, the debates, all of it. OK, let's uh, let's unpack this. Right. So blockchain at its heart, like we said, it's a decentralized digital ledger, a shared notebook, basically. But the really revolutionary part isn't just that it's spread out, it's that it minimizes the need for trust in one central place. Well, trust minimization. Yeah. yeah, it stores records securely across lots of computers, no single boss needed. And the structure, it inherently brings transparency. Things are out in the open. Immutability records can't be easily changed once they're in. And uh, pretty robust security. Trust shifts from, say, a bank to the network itself okay. to the math. Okay, so decentralized. But how does it actually work? If there's no central person checking things, how do those blocks of data get linked together and, you know, verified? Good question. It works by uh, chaining these blocks of data together. Each block holds a batch of transactions. Now, the clever part is the cryptographic consensus. Before a new block gets added, the participants on the network, they have to cryptographically agree that the data in that block is valid. So it's like a digital vote. Sort of, but uh, more sophisticated. It's not just majority rules. It often involves economic incentives, mathematical proofs. It makes tampering with a block once it's confirmed and added incredibly difficult, practically impossible. That's where decentralization becomes really powerful, distributed checking, shared control over the data. And that distributed trust, it's not just a tech detail, is it? It feels like it hits right at the core of how things usually work. Exactly. It disrupts traditional economic models because it removes the need for those central intermediaries, banks, clearinghouses, sometimes even lawyers, that cuts costs, sometimes drastically. And it fundamentally changes how we establish and maintain trust. You're not trusting a specific company's promise. You're trusting the code, the cryptography, and the network's design. That's a big shift in thinking. It really is. And if you look at the scale, the World Economic Forum estimated that uh, by 2025, something like 10 percent of global GDP could be stored or transacted on blockchain systems. That's huge. Wow. 10 percent. Yeah. It signals a massive potential overhaul in how value moves, how contracts are enforced, how data is secured. Think about um, tracking goods around the world a complex supply chain. With blockchain, you could potentially have an unchangeable, transparent record for every single step, from the raw materials to the final product on the shelf. So real accountability. Unprecedented accountability, potentially. Or imagine sending money overseas. Instead of waiting days and paying hefty bank fees, you could potentially do it in seconds, almost for free. That's blockchain in action. Okay, so that's the foundation of the blockchain. Now let's talk about what runs on top of it, cryptocurrencies. Digital money, essentially. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin being the most famous one, obviously. Right. 
And they're more than just digital coins. They really challenge our traditional ideas about money. They're built to be peer-to-peer, -peer, so person-to-person -person directly, often borderless. And crucially, they operate outside the traditional banking system. No central bank issuing them, usually. And you mentioned transparency. How does that work if it's digital? Well, while users are often pseudonymous, not directly tied to real-world names, the transactions themselves are recorded on that public ledger, the blockchain. So you can trace the flow of funds. Transparency is kind of baked into the system. And it's not just Bitcoin anymore, is it? The landscape seems much more diverse now. Oh, absolutely. It's exploded. Bitcoin is often called digital gold. Designed as a store of value, scarce, with a fixed supply, its security relies on proof of work which uh, involves a lot of computing power. The energy debate we hear about. Exactly. That's a big part of the Bitcoin discussion. Then you have Ethereum. Ethereum is, well, it's different. Less about just being money, more like a global computer or a settlement layer that you can build things on. It supports smart contracts. Okay. What are smart contracts, simply? Think of them as self-executing agreements. The terms are written directly into code. So if X happens, then automatically do Y. Ethereum made a big switch in 2022 to proof of stake. Right, I remember that, the merge. Yeah, the merge. That drastically cut its energy use by something like 99%, huge reduction. But it also brought up new discussions about, you know, who holds the stake and does that centralize things in a different way. It's complicated. But Ethereum is really the engine behind a lot of DeFi, decentralized finance and NFTs, non-fungible tokens. In stable coins. Yeah. You mentioned Bank of America is keen on them. They seem less volatile. That's the idea. Stable coins are designed to hold a stable value, usually by being pegged to a real world currency like the US dollar. So one stable coin equals $1 more or less. This makes them useful for payments, trading, avoiding the wild price swings of say Bitcoin. And yes, we're seeing regulators, especially in the US, trying to figure out how to bring them into the formal financial system. They see the potential for faster, cheaper payments. Okay, and you mentioned DeFi decentralized finance. What does that entail? DeFi is essentially trying to rebuild financial services, lending, borrowing, exchanging assets, earning interest, but using blockchain and smart contracts instead of traditional banks and brokers. It's all happening directly on the chain, peer to peer, governed by code, Think automated market makers, AMMs, for trading without needing a company in the middle. It's a whole parallel financial world being built. So it sounds like we're moving beyond just digital versions of coins. This idea of programmable money keeps coming up. What's that actually mean in practice? Money that has code built into it. Exactly. Programmable money opens up really interesting possibilities. Imagine uh, your digital wallet automatically earning interest based on rules coded into the currency itself. Or think about real estate. You could tokenize a property represent ownership with digital tokens on a blockchain. So you could own like a tiny fraction of an apartment building. Precisely. And you could trade that fraction instantly, globally, without needing complex legal processes and escrow agents. The rules are in the code. Or think about insurance. Maybe a smart contract that automatically pays out an insurance claim if certain conditions are met and verified on the blockchain, like flight delay data being confirmed. No need for manual claims processing. Money becomes active, intelligent, not just passive. Okay, this is fascinating, but why is this all hitting critical mass now in 2025? It feels different than a few years ago. It does feel different. I think part of it is maturity. Bitcoin hitting that, you know, 123 K mark, even if it fluctuates, it signals growing confidence, especially from institutions. And the legislation we mentioned, like the Genius Act, that's not just about controlling crypto, it's about integrating it, recognizing it as a legitimate part of the financial landscape. It's becoming a recognized asset class. And it's not just tech startups anymore. The big traditional finance players are involved. Deeply involved. You see Visa, JP Morgan, Bank of America, PayPal. They're not just watching, they're actively building services using stablecoins, using Ethereum. They see this technology as potentially a fundamental reset for how finance works. Tokenizing assets, making settlements faster and cheaper, exploring DeFi. These ideas are gaining real traction inside major firms now. But this also brings up tricky issues, right? Like privacy. Absolutely. That's a huge ongoing debate. Look at the situation with tools like Tornado Cash. It's a service designed to enhance privacy on the blockchain, but uh, regulators are concerned it can be used for money laundering. This has led to really important legal fights about financial privacy, about whether writing code is free speech, and how responsible developers are if their open source tools are misused. These cases are setting precedents right now. So beyond the finance world and the legal battles, 
What about everyday applications? Where might you or I actually see this making a difference? Well, one really powerful example is in cross-border aid. The UN used blockchain tech to get funds directly to Ukrainian refugees, bypassing slow, expensive, traditional banking channels, getting money to people in need within minutes. That's not theory. That's real-world impact. That's incredibly compelling. What else? The tokenization we talked about that's starting to happen, representing ownership of things like real estate or art as digital tokens. It could make investing in these kinds of assets much more accessible to average people. Fractional ownership, global trading. So democratizing investment. Potentially, yes. Then there are the DeFi tools. Things like lending platforms where you can borrow or lend crypto directly, yield farming where you try to earn returns by providing liquidity, even new kinds of insurance built on chain. It's all growing incredibly fast, though it's important to stress, still very risky. Right. High risk, high reward, maybe. Or just high risk sometimes. And smart contracts are enabling all sorts of things. Automated escrow services, online voting systems, even whole organizations run by code, these decentralized autonomous organizations, or DAOs. The rules are transparent, executed automatically. And supply chains, you mentioned that earlier. Yes, that's another big one. Using blockchain to create an unchangeable record of where a product came from, who handled it, when, Think food safety tracing contamination back to the source quickly, or proving the authenticity of luxury goods makes it much harder to fake things or hide problems. Okay, this all sounds incredibly promising, revolutionary even, but mm. like any powerful new tech, there must be downsides, risks, things people need to be really careful about. Oh, absolutely. Let's not sugarcoat it. The biggest thing most people see is the volatility. Prices can swing wildly. And scams are, unfortunately, still quite common. It's not regulated like your bank account. So if you lose money to a hack or a bad investment, there's often no safety net. And you hear critiques like Jamie Dimon saying Bitcoin is mainly for criminals. Yeah, that critique persists. And look, there's no denying some illicit actors use crypto because of its perceived anonymity or borderless nature. That's a genuine concern regulators grapple with. But a focusing only on that ignores the vast majority of legitimate use and innovation happening. It's a bit like saying the Internet is only for criminals because some use it for bad things. What about the energy usage? That still comes up a lot. It does, and it's a valid point, especially for Bitcoin's proof of work. It consumes a lot of electricity. But the industry is aware and changing. Like we mentioned, Ethereum's shift to proof of stake cut its energy use by about 99%. Many newer blockchains are designed from the ground up to be energy efficient. Mm. So it's nuanced. Not all crypto is the same in terms of environmental impact. And the rules are still being written, right? Regulatory uncertainty. That's a huge challenge. Governments around the world are playing catch-up. Is crypto a currency, a commodity, a security? The rules are different everywhere, and they're still evolving. This creates uncertainty for businesses and users, and it fuels that debate. Is this technology about freedom, or does it just make it easier for bad actors? And smart contracts, you said code is law. What happens if the code itself is flawed? That is a critical risk. We've seen major hacks where millions were lost because of a bug in a smart contract's code. Since blockchain transactions are generally irreversible, once the money is gone due to a bug or exploit, it's usually gone for good. Wow. So you can't just call customer service. Pretty much no. Now, the auditing of these smart contracts is getting better. There are firms that specialize in finding vulnerabilities, but the risk is still there. Code is law means flaws in the code have real, often permanent financial consequences. Users need to be incredibly careful and understand what they're interacting with. Okay, so there's huge potential, but also significant risks. If someone listening has grasped the basics and wants to, you know, maybe explore this space a bit more safely, what's your advice? How do you navigate all this complexity? Well, the classic advice is start small. Only invest or experiment with what you can truly afford to lose. That's paramount. But beyond that, really focus on understanding self-custody. Learn about wallets. Hot wallets versus cold wallets. Exactly. Hot wallets are connected to the internet, convenient for trading, but more vulnerable. Cold wallets are offline, much more secure for long-term holding. Understanding how to manage your own keys securely is crucial if you want true ownership, not just relying on an exchange. That sounds like a learning curve in itself. It is. And when you do use platforms like exchanges to buy or sell, stick to reputable ones. Look for platforms with strong security measures, insurance funds, and proper know-your-customer KYC procedures. They offer at least some layer of protection compared to uh, totally unregulated spaces. And staying informed seems key, given how fast everything changes. 
absolutely critical. You can't just learn it once. Follow reliable sources. There are great podcasts out there like Unchained or Bankless. Publications like Crypto Trends offer deeper analysis. Keep learning about specific projects, regulatory news, emerging risks. It's an ongoing process. What about actually trying things out beyond just buying Bitcoin? If you're really curious about DeFi or NFTs, maybe try experimenting cautiously. Use test nets first. They're like practice networks where you use fake money. Or if you use real networks, start with incredibly small amounts, tiny amounts. Just understand the mechanics of using a decentralized application, interacting with a smart contract, paying gas fees. Get a feel for it without putting serious funds at risk. Right. Learn by doing, but safely. Exactly. Dip your toe in, don't dive head first. Wow. Okay. We have covered a lot of ground today. Yeah. We went from the basics of blockchain, that foundation of decentralized trust. And how it enables new forms of organization. Right. Then into the world of cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Ethereum, stablecoins, DeFi, understanding their designs, not just their prices. The different philosophies behind them. Yeah. And then we really tried to connect it to today, 2025. The real world impact, the laws changing, the big institutions getting involved, the everyday uses popping up. And crucially, the risks and challenges too. The volatility, the security concerns, the regulatory questions. Absolutely. It's complex, it's moving fast, and it seems like it's touching everything from finance to law to how we might interact online daily. It really is a landscape that demands ongoing attention. Understanding the what is one thing, but the how and the why, that's where the real insight lies. So a final thought for everyone listening, as you go about your week, maybe reflect on this, is your own mindset truly ready for the money of tomorrow, for the new ways of thinking about trust and value that this technology demands? It's a good question to ponder. If you found this deep dive useful, please do hit follow on your app and maybe share it with a friend or colleague who's curious about all this. And Definitely tune in next time we're going to be talking with a DeFi founder, someone actually in the trenches, building what they hope is a truly decentralized bank from scratch. Should be fascinating. Looking forward to that. Until then, enrich minds and support curiosity.